We thank you for supporting AgriPulse throughout the year and for being here today. And I promise you some of the best uh, uh, coming here just a little bit later uh, after we finish this program. But this one is important. Uh, when we start thinking about this policy and the movement ahead and the work that has to be done, the conversation we'll have here over the next few minutes I really feel like is going to be key. So let me do the, uh, the sponsor part. First of all, we want to thank uh, a generous donation from Bayer. This panel discussion focuses on the intersection of climate, conservation, and crop insurance policies. I'm a visual learner, so I like to, I like to have analogies. And I can imagine uh, a country road, city street, wherever else it might be, that there's three roads that come together and there's one automobile that's conservation. And there's another automobile that's there and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's climate. And then the other is crop insurance. And they're all waiting to see who's, in, who's going first and who's the most important. And I don't know that one is over the other, but certainly they all play a role and they're going to play a role uh, in this particular policy. Let me introduce uh, our, our guest uh, for you during this part of the program. Tara Smith uh, is the executive vice president for the Tory Advisory Group. Uh, she is a team leader in developing and implementing legislative and regulatory strategies, building coalitions and informing policymakers on client priorities, including work for crop insurance and the reinsurance bureau. Now, here's the rest of the story. Uh, she spent time working for the Senate Ag Committee under Senator Pat Roberts. So let's give Tara a hand. Now, Dan Christensen is the Senior Director for Government Affairs uh, for PepsiCo. By the way, thanks for the, the sodas and the chips. Um, I'm still carrying those with me, and I'll see how much room is in, and folks don't let those go to waste. Uh, he leads PepsiCo's policy engagement with the federal government, served at the Department of Agriculture from 2000 to 11 to 16, uh, including time with Ag Secretary Vilsack. But now here's the rest of the story for him. He served for several years as senior professional staff member on the Senate Ag uh, Agriculture Committee, first under Chairman Tom Harkin, and then also uh, Chairwoman Blanche Lincoln. Two completely different versions of English with those folks, right? <laughs> but still on the same topic of agriculture. And as I try to organize my thoughts here, forgive me for this, I want to introduce the other folks and then we, we get down to business. Andrew Lenz, how much, how much sleep are you getting at night? Actually, pretty good. Pretty good, okay. Andrew is a new dad, so let's, let's give him a hand. What do you say? <laughs> Director of Federal Affairs for Ag Policy for the Environmental Defense Fund uh, leads their engagement with policymakers at the federal level, uh, advancing climate smart agriculture, shaping proposals for the upcoming Farm Bill. He works closely with the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, uh, for which EDF also serves as a co-chair. Now, I don't want to leave this guy out because uh, I think every year that I've moderated, I've had a chance to work with you, Chuck. So that's either your curse or a blessing for me, one or the other. I'm not sure why. which. <laughs> Chuck Connors, President and CEO of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, more than 25 years experience in national and state government, served both as USDA's acting secretary and deputy secretary. He helped to shape the Bush administration's ag trade and immigration policies. So let's play this game for just a second. I'll start, Andrew, on your end, if you'll pick up your mic and use us there. How many farm bills have you been involved in? Um, well, on this side of things, it's, this will be my first, so. Um, okay. Yeah, still. Jared? This will be my sixth. Your sixth. Dan? Fourth. Fourth. Ninth. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have the microphone there, Chuck. Nine. Joe. Nine. The only reason I didn't feel bad at answering the question is I knew Chuck would have me <laughs> topped at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, so I, I was guilty of asking this question, Chuck, earlier this year. I'll start with you. Uh, would climate replace conservation in the Farm Bill? So maybe the better question here is, how does climate policy and conservation policy merge, or do they? I don't see it being a choice, Jeff. Uh, just having had uh, you know a, a lot of farm bill experience and conservation title experiences, we have used the conservation title many, many times throughout the years to solve problems uh, that were you know facing us in American agriculture. I remember the early farm bills; soil erosion was a, a big dang deal, and 
we used those programs to, to, in effect, eliminate that from the sky is falling kinds of debates that occurred out there, you know, not only at, at the farm level, but were being pushed, you know, down to the farm level. You got to solve this, you got to solve this. I see in the climate space the conservation title serving much that same kind of role going forward. We've got a climate problem out there. We've got climate issues that need to be addressed. How do we do that? Much of what we're proposing, and we've been working closely with Andrew and his organization, is, is the same model as what we have solved a lot of those kinds of problems. Wetlands being another example out there. I mean, th th these are proven programs. They work. They're going to have a little bit of a, uh, a focus on climate, even though a lot of these benefits overlap across many you know, problems being solved out there. And I, I see it, again, like it has been in the past, being a win-win for those who are advocating but are producers as well. And if we don't have that, it won't happen. It's got to be a win-win for everybody. So it's just an add-on with climate? Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a pursuing the same you know, Maybe okay. in your analogy, there might be another fork in that road, but it's still all moving in the same direction. Andrew, a long history of the Environmental Defense Fund, and it's in your mission statement regard of protecting our natural resources. Um, you've been involved in farm bills before, a long history there. Um, we've achieved some goals, I believe, that are common with policy and conservation toward perhaps your mission. What, are, what, what crossroad are we at now from an environmental standpoint that your group is hoping for out of this policy? Yeah, I think, well, it's been really encouraging. I think, you know, obviously back in um, February, uh, the Food and Ag Climate Alliance released their recommendations for the Farm Bill. And I think that partnership, that coalition was really historic in that it brought both the environmental community and the agriculture, you know, the farm and food and agriculture community together to come up with recommendations and find some common ground, and I actually think we found a lot more common ground than maybe we even initially thought we would at the very beginning when we were first um, uh, first organizing. And so we came up with about 109 recommendations, um, all agreed to by unanimous consent within our organization. And, um, you know, we had 23 steering committee members that all had to agree on these things um, unanimously. So it was really a huge accomplishment, and I think set a really productive tone heading into this farm bill in terms of, you know, maybe the environmental community and and um, the agriculture communities maybe didn't work as closely together in the past like they like they could have, and now we're really sort of both seeing the the benefits um, of working together rather than working against each other. Well, so there was a period of time we were talking about policy that uh, we might have got a farm bill done alone with agriculture alone. And then we've opened the door, and there are so many other players that are involved now that it takes to be able to get this policy over the finish line. Tara, let's think about this. If we ask commodity groups, they would probably say do no harm. I think that's what they said for the 18. I think they'd probably echo that right now. But from a crop insurance standpoint, what are the issues here uh, outside of do no harm that changes could be made that could improve the function of the system and also the effectiveness from risk management for the producer. Yeah, I mean, I think the line we use is protect and preserve. Um, so when we talk about crop insurance a lot, we talk about protect and preserve the program. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? I mean, we touch 480 plus million acres in the United States. Crop insurance touches more acres than any other single program in the Farm Bill. Um, it impacts more farmers than any other single program in the Farm Bill. So it's obviously a very important tool for farmers. It's also a flexible tool, though. It was intentionally designed to have flexibility built in. So as we face new problems within agriculture, um, there is some flexibility within crop insurance to address those new problems. But there are also some, some guardrails in place within the program. And so, you know, we've been at the table for this discussion to be sure that program uh, that crop insurance is sort of living up to its potential to address those new challenges, but at the same time, we're keeping it between the lines, if you will, that we're, we're maintaining an actuarially sound program, because if I didn't say that word very soon in my presentation, <laughs> I would get in trouble. Uh, so we're, you know, maintaining an actuarially sound program. We're making 
making sure we're not putting mandates on our farmer customers. We're not um, doing anything to take money from the core of the program that farmers need in order to meet some of these conservation needs. So in other words, how can we be flexible, be at the table, be helpful, but still maintain that program? Now, I'm not exhaustive nationwide, but I have had the opportunity to talk to uh, a number of uh, producers across the country. Commodity Classic was an opportunity last night, uh, last week. Uh, I am staying at a Holiday Inn, so that probably helps just a little bit. <laughs> but, but when I talk to producers about their marketing plans and what they use for risk management, they say two things. First of all, more pressure on them from their marketing plan, hedging options, futures to manage, and crop insurance. Those two together, ARC and PLC, not what Title I would have been years ago, but lots of pressure on their marketing decisions and on the choices that they make in crop insurance. That's why I ask is, are there areas that could improve this and help them manage uh, higher input costs and higher inflation? I mean, again, the program is meant to be evolutionary, right? I mean, it, it's meant to, there, there's an entire program within crop insurance called 508H that is intentionally designed to help create new programs to help farmers meet new kinds of risk or for new commodities that may be grown in new regions. Um, so I think you have to find ways to take advantage of, of that intentional flexibility um, but again, you have to do it in a smart way that's not upending that program because it's so important, as you learned at Commodity Classic, to so many farmers. Because if uh, finding ways to combine crop insurance and conservation upends the program at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I think farmers are going to be pretty unhappy with that end result. So the first farm bill that I watched was in the early 80s. And Dan, I'm a 63 model, which means I'm a part of the metallic age silver hair, gold teeth, lead bottom. Uh, <laughs> but I'm also a part of that time, the Pepsi generation. That was the advertisement, the, pe the Pepsi generation. I was kind of surprised years ago when we brought Ducks Unlimited in and we brought in some of the, the other you know, livestock groups and Lord help them, they help us to accomplish that. But now we're talking about PepsiCo. And as you're sitting here now among conservation and crop insurance and production practices, What's your interest in this policy? And, and, and what do you want to bring to the table or get from it? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for the question, Jeff. And great to be here with, with everybody. Um, so I think the best way to answer that is just to kind of start the, about you know, who are we as a company, right? And what is PepsiCo? And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it, pretty much every finished commodity product we make starts with a commodity in the ground, right? Uh, think about our potato chips, they start with a potato. Think about our corn chips, they start with corn, right? Um, a lot of our beverages, a lot of HFCS goes into those, um, sugar beets go into those, right? So at our root, you know, we, uh, we're, we're an agriculture company, right? Um, we're farther along the value chain um, than, you know, maybe folks on the farm are, but you know, at the end of the day, those are our roots. Um, so when we think about this space, you know, we think about it from the perspective of protecting the resilience of our supply chain, making sure that our farmers can focus on farming, that we've got their back with whatever they need. Um, and in our supply chain for PepsiCo, you know, we're, we're big, right? So across the country, you're talking about 1.5 million uh, metric tons of potatoes that we source annually, 2.5 million metric tons of corn, 12,000 farmers across the country that we work with. Some of those direct contractual relationships, like in our potato supply chain, some some of that we're buying off the market. You know, corn uh, farmers that work for Bungie or Cargill and are also supplying to others in the food and beverage supply chain. So. You know, at the end of the day, it's making sure that um, those farmers, our farmers, can continue doing what they're doing now and well into the future. Um, and so we, and how we show up, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, right? So at the end of the day, uh, what's good for even the same potato farmer in the same region could be different depending on their needs and their growing conditions. So what we try and do is show up and, and listen, and that's step number one, because uh, they understand their operation better than we are ever going to. Uh, but you know, the needs may be different. Sometimes it's good agronomic assistance. Sometimes it's financial assistance. You know, sometimes um, you know, they, they want us to help be a voice for them, right? Help, help make that connection between consumers and where their food comes from. And so I'm, I'm really excited if I can just do a quick plug. Sure. You know, the, the ad we're going to show after this is part of our new Golden Grows Here campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about our potato farmers. 
And you can't make this stuff up, guys. This is crazy. So our Consumer Insights team did all the research into this campaign before we launched it this month. And what they found was that 40% of consumers did not know that potato chips came from a potato, right? <laughs> it's serious. You can't, you can't make this up. And so I think the business rightly viewed it as an opportunity and a responsibility to help correct that, help start doing their part to educate consumers. So you'll see the spot. It's really clever, only 30 seconds, but it draws that connection again between where the food's grown, how it's grown, the finished product, and, and that it's a, a local grown product. So that's, that's, that's part of our interest. Yeah. yeah. Here's a tidbit on me. I didn't get to work for Mr. Roberts and Mr. Harkin, but my grandma was a chip picker for Charles Chips, potato chips in Calhoun, Kentucky. And the best thing in the world when you're a young man is to see your grandma carrying a three-pound bag of warm, hot potatoes to go with an RC call in the <laughs> afternoon. <sighs> I still reminisce on that. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> let, let, let's move on. So let's throw this out. The, there is a day and age, and the, even there's people who are marketing today that want to improve their face in the eyes of the consumer. And they are wanting to show that they are environmentally sensitive, but maybe not they're not willing to do it. They've been willing to pay farmers. They've been willing to pay other people to make the effort so they can count it as a credit. Mr. Vilsack talks about this being an alternative revenue stream. Now, this is not a part of Farm Bill, but at some point we have seen investment. We have seen movement toward this area. What do you think in this bill if climate and crop insurance and conservation are going to come together? Are these alternate revenue streams, do they find a way into the, into the text of the final language? See, I'm not calling on anybody. You can pounce on that. Yeah, I think there's actually a lot of great work being done in that space right now. Um, groups like ESMC, I see Debbie's in the room here, my former organization. They're doing a lot of that quantification and opening up these new revenue streams and doing the really hard work of, of quantifying these environmental benefits uh, to a degree that um, you can actually generate these types of credits on. And so, uh, you know, Secretary Vilsack mentioned that in his, in, in his remarks earlier. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity and really exciting um, and, and a way to, to further bridge, um, you know, the environmental and, and farming communities. I agree with everything Andrew just said. Um, what to, to flip this into a little bit of a policy debate though, Jeff, I do not see the 2023 Farm Bill, which certainly one of the goals of that is to provide farmers the best shake we possibly can to cover costs out there. I mean, that, that's been the goal of Farm Bills since, since the beginning. This supplemental income that we're talking about will not drive that effort, I don't believe, in, in terms of policy in Congress. You're not gonna see Bozeman stand up and say, well, I can probably take a little bit less on this because there's potential here and here for the supplemental income. It's not going to be a farm bill driver. I think it's a huge policy process for us to not get in the way of because the market is, dri is, is driving this very, very rapidly. But we're still going to have to do it in the context, I think, of, of those traditional um, issues still driving Title I, driving the crop insurance and the conservation title. But you're still talking about bringing revenue to the farm, and this is an alternate stream, not just for the fruit of the crop that you produce, but for the way that you produce it. So then the thought, Dan, is there a place where private funds want to come alongside agriculture, whether for research, whether for growth, uh, whether uh, a partnership between the producer, the government, and the company. Are there things that have happened that you have seen that you're encouraged by? Are there other things that could come to pass that might draw your company or others to the farm, to the farm side? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I mean, it's, it's an area of incredible interest um, for our company. And I should, I should mention, you know, this is, we're, we're already active here. I mean, we were fortunate. We were one of the two projects that Secretary Vilsack 
um, signed when he was down in Commodity Classic a couple week ex a weeks ago. So, um, you know, we'll be getting that work underway very soon with our partners to help sign up growers for the programs there. And, you know, I'm proud to say PepsiCo is the largest private sector um, funder of corporate match for, for that, that project. For both the projects we're in, we're committing over $200 million. Um, so it's real money. That we're not counting commodities that we're already going to buy. This is new additional resources to you know, help drive, um, you know, practices at the ground level. And, you know, this is going to be a multi-year investment for our companies. So this isn't, you know, kind of a one and done type issue for us. We're, we're committed, right? We want to be there, like I said, to show up and meet the farmer where they're at um, and help provide the resources that they need, whether that's, you know, per acre subsidies for adopting cover crop practices, whether it's, you know, agronomic assistance, whatever the case may be, uh, we just want to be there to show up and help. Yeah. Okay. So, Gentlemen, uh, you were both a part of the Food and Ag uh, Climate Alliance. Um, and it's interesting as well. PepsiCo, you're also a part of that as well. So what accomplishments, what, what, part, of the, what part of the debate, um, when you come to a unanimous, unanimous decision, should follow through in a new bill? I apologize, I apologize if I misspoke. Um, I, th I think, Jeff, if I understand your question, the, 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 the part that's really, you know, you're going to see follow on is the unity associated with the recommendations from the alliance. Okay. And that, you know, unity around a lot of principles, but the just general unity that we have. But fundamentally, at the beginning, you know, we agreed that this not only had to be bipartisan, but had to really be pro-farmer. And, you know, that was not by chance. We, we, we were really determined that we were not gonna make progress in this climate space over the strong objections of farmers out there. It just wasn't gonna happen. And you know, EDF and a lot of the others who, who may not have you know, been playing in this space recognize that, and we've made tremendous progress because of that recognition. So what do you absolutely not want? Let me turn it around. What are the things you absolutely would not be a part of in this particular bill? Mandates yeah. on our farmers. Compliance. Yeah. Compliance. Compliance mandates. and mandates. Yep. Are there others? Well, our principles, uh, the FAC principles, sort of outlined what we seek to, in, in any legislation, that's bipartisanship, um, incentive-based, science-based um, policies that, um, mm -hmm. that really provide incentives rather than mandates uh, for farmers. And to, to, so to it's going to be voluntary. Yes. We're going to make sure that it's exactly. voluntary. That's right. But what about that side of the aisle that wants to make those things mandatory, that wants to tie hook and ladder to things in order to have that benefit, that says if you're going to be able to buy up on crop insurance, you're going to have to be doing certain things. Or if you're of a certain size, then you're only going to be incentivized up to a particular level and then no more, because those words are already out there. Yeah, I mean, we see these same challenges every farm bill with crop insurance, right? They fall into three of the buckets. You hit on means testing. Um, we see folks go after the farmer premium discount. We see folks go after um, the companies and the private sector delivery that farmers rely on to get the product. So these things aren't new. We do see attempts to uh, impose additional mandates on farmers. Again, those are our customers as the crop insurance industry, and we don't wanna see that. Um, and our farmer customers don't wanna see it, more importantly. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that if you care about climate change, crop insurance is the first line of defense against climate change. So doing things that, that will make it more difficult for farmers to utilize that program is a little antithetical to actually caring about climate change and caring about what's going on on the ground with, with farmers and climate change. If I can add to that, Jeff, too. I mean, that's so, to Tara's point that this is not new, right? And we get this all the time, right? Well, just, just require your farmers to do this. It just doesn't work. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's the simple thing if you, if you try to educate people. It just doesn't work, right? I mean, you can't force people to do these things. And at the end of the day, um, you're going to catch a lot more flies with honey, right? And so when we work with growers, again, showing up, understanding where they're at today, for, for a lot of this work advancing practices, right, you're, you got farmers that may be dabbling in it, right? Maybe they're doing 5% of their acreage is cover cropping or something like that. So you're coming in and it's the conversation, okay, well, what would it take to get you to 
20%? What would it take to get you to 50%? I think you'll find really quickly if you uh, approach the conversation with humility, admit, admitting what you don't know, acknowledge that the farmer knows their operation better than you're ever gonna, and that you're there to help, I think you very quickly find you know, what it is that it's gonna take to get from point A to point B without forcing anybody to do anything. Terry, you may wanna whop me when this question is over, but I'm gonna walk down this road if we can. I talked to a producer who was a delegate uh, from my home state of Kentucky, and he mentioned over the past six years, he'd spent about $60,000 a year purchasing crop insurance. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that in none of those years did he get a claim. Mm -hmm. And that if he had filed a claim, not only would he have paid the premium, but he had to lose crop in order to see it. I talked to some producers who have rich black dirt, and they buy crop insurance because it's affordable, but truthfully, they really don't need it. But I'll talk to other producers who have thin soil and more um, extreme weather environments. They're more apt to lose, and they have to have crop insurance. How delicately balanced is this situation? And what happens if those who don't necessarily need it as much don't buy it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, just reminding folks that farmers get a bill for their crop insurance, not a check, is important in and of itself because I think we have a lot of folks on the Hill who don't even fully understand that piece of this puzzle. Um, farmers have skin in the game. Um, just like the crop insurance companies do and just like the taxpayers do. Um, but it is a balance. Again, the program is actuarially sound. So if you are in a higher risk area or you grow a more valuable crop, your bill is going to be a little bit more. Um, but the federal government's still going to pick up the same percentage of that total premium as they would any other farmer along the way. Um, I think it is important though to be sure we have that really broad and deep risk pool of farmers participating in the crop insurance program because it's like, um, it'd be like kicking all the healthy people out of your health insurance pool. Everybody's premiums are gonna go up if you do something like that. So you want to be sure that you have the, the broadest and deepest risk pool you can possibly have because that helps keep everybody, everybody's premiums low. Some people may want to dip a toe into the idea that, okay, let's start with a soil grading system, that this soil is of a particular type, it has a, a particular humus matter, and therefore shouldn't cost as much, which might be an incentive for some producers to employ various cropping practices to build up the, the, the health and the quality of their soil. Is this something that's, that's been floated more than just now in this conversation on this stage? I mean, we've heard things like that before. Keep in mind that farmers are rewarded through a higher APH if they're right. doing the right things, mm -hmm. um, if they're taking care of their land and, and, and those kinds of things. They're already being rewarded on, on their APH. Um, and their premiums are likely to be lower in, in the process as well. So that's already sort of built into the system, if you will. Um, I think it gets a little bit more dangerous when folks want to start tinkering with what else could be done in those policies mm -hmm. um, to add an additional incentive. Because again, the entire program is based on actuarial soundness. And if you lose that underlying integrity of the program, you have the ability to upset the apple cart very quickly um, and, and lose companies who would want to service those policies, lose farmers in the process, um, and even lose public support. So we have tremendous conservation programs, and I noticed from looking at FACA, you support a lot of the programs that are already there, and it has been publicized lately. A lot of those are oversubscribed, so it would be easy to say the best thing we can do is just fund those, but are there others? Or how do you balance making sure those are funded and also providing opportunity for, for extras or incentive for extra cropping pr programs? With, I will just say, I, you know, I, I think there, I think there are opportunities certainly to to, re, to strengthen the crop insurance program through um, reducing costs and and, and um, you know having uh, strengthen it through cost savings essentially. And you know, the Meridian Institute released a report a, a few weeks ago uh, showing that um, conservation practices such as no-till and, and cover crops can actually reduce prevent plant. Cr uh, claims by about 24% in certain states. And so, um, you know, 
finding ways to incentivize that or at least remove disincentives from, um, from programs to allow for these conservation pro uh, practices to be further adopted um, can really insulate maybe programs, strengthen these programs and also maybe insulate them from um, attempts in Congress to um, you know, reduce mandatory funding in the Farm Bill. Chuck, I've seen where the administration's willing to offer a, a five bucks an acre for cover crops. That's great for areas where you've got cover crops. It won't pay the whole bill, but there's not everybody in the country and not every region in the country that can benefit from a cover crop. Some just don't have enough moisture for it, and some the climate doesn't support it. Well, that's right, Jeff, and I'm, I'm not in any way criticizing the administration's effort here because I do not think cover crops provide tremendous value out there, and they are applicable on many, many farms. Not every farm. And so I think that's why our you know, efforts in the, in the Food and Ag Climate Alliance and really other initiatives that we've all been engaged in provide a lot of flexibility out there for farmers. You're going to need that. Mm -hmm. You know, cover crops are not the sole solution, you know, to our climate problems out there. It's a, it's a web of issues that um, we believe our, you know, many of our conservation programs cover, including uh, cover crops. And, um, you know, you've got to have that flexibility, and that's one of the reasons why volunteerism is a, is a key component of this. If we were telling every producer out there, you will plant cover crops, we may help you financially, but you will plant cover crops, boy, you know, this room would be full, uh, and, and they wouldn't be very happy. You know, you've got to give producers flexibility here to manage their farms as they see fit, and Again, many of our traditional people who didn't work with us on this have come to that realization and have been real great partners, uh, two of who are sitting here uh, who recognize this. Mm -hmm. Andrew, outspoken support from the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, among other environmental groups. I'm curious in a question from the crowd, um, ha did, have you taken any heat from other groups for being for accepting this particular role and coming alongside these other groups? And, and accepting uh, this 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 leadership position, you know, I don't. I think we have a commitment to our partners and to our fellow coalition partners, and that's what we're really concerned about. I, you know, I think, um, you know, we we feel really comfortable playing that role and really meeting um, people where they are. And 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 Dan mentioned it, being humble in terms of learning from folks. I mean, we have a, what's called. Uh, called the Top Producers Network, which is sort of an advisory committee of, of farmers throughout uh, throughout the country that we meet with to discuss uh, these policy positions that we're considering taking. And so, uh, but we know that we're not going to have any success or make any progress without consulting with farmers. Um, and we know that that's the only way to do these programs. And anyone who would support, you know, broad mandates and things like that just aren't talking to farmers enough, and they don't know what works best. And so. Um, that's what we really try to do. We really want to work um, with with folks on um, finding policies that can be adopted and, and really sort of moving that Overton window uh, in a way that can make progress. And so we're not really concerned about what others are saying about us necessarily. Thank you for your leadership. I remind you, uh, please, if you would, if you have other questions you want to offer to the group, get on Slido and I'll try to work through as many of those as we can as we wrap up here today. Uh, a question for the group, if you will. Can uh, we get more conservation practices recognized by the Risk Management Agency for not only producing conservation benefits, uh, benefits but also reducing risk? Thoughts? I'll try to tackle this one a little bit. Okay. So within crop insurance, we have what's called good farming practices that farmers have to meet in order for their, their policy to be um, recognized. Um, and certainly we want to be sure that as farmers change conservation practices, as new conservation practices become available, that crop insurance is able to be flexible and adjust to that as well. And so there is a system in place that allows those good farming practices to adjust as new conservation practices become available um, and become sort of recognized, if you will, among agronomists as good farming practices. So that's sort of built in already. I think a lot of folks probably aren't aware that that's already in place. And some folks might think it moves too slowly, um, that things don't move fast enough on that front. 
Um, but again, there is a mechanism in place within crop insurance because it is it, it does have that that flexibility to sort of do that now. You've also got a situation that is with canola, but especially with wheat, that there are some places that cover crops don't work. But gee, in Kentucky, in the in in my early days, we used wheat as a cover crop because the yield wasn't much, but there are there is a value for having wheat in the field, but because it's harvested, it may not. Uh, be able to reap the benefits of other covers that are in place. Is this an area that we should try to find a compromise because there's a benefit for having that cover in the field? This difference between a cover crop and a second crop, I think is gonna be ripe for discussion during this farm bill. But I think um, the distinction between the two is whether you harvest it or not. And I think we have to be really careful um, about the incentives that we're creating for folks within the program um, because a second crop is treated very differently than a cover crop within the program. And I just would say, Jeff, I think we need to be, be careful here um, just in terms of the credibility of the program. And I say that, you know, we're all about science and we're all about the facts, but we also, you know, we've got legislation to pa pass in a political environment. We just, we need to be cautious because the program is going in the right direction. It really is, and I think we would all acknowledge that, and we don't want to throw a speed bump in there by opening up the whole debate of, oh my gosh, you know, you're, you're getting a crop, and yet you're collecting, and then it's just, it, it's sticky, and it's just something that we would have to be very, very cautious about. Dan, help me with your company and, and inside the, the Farm Bill. I, I don't claim to know everything that there is to know that, uh, and the different intersections that they come together, uh, but you do obviously benefit from, from what farmers are producing, but you're also showing that where public-private dollars can come together and that you are sensitive to the environment and preserving resources. What are areas here that if you had the opportunity to testify before either committee, what are the things that you would encourage them to look at? Yeah, I mean, it, for us, it's pretty straightforward. It's public-private partnerships, right? I mean, how do we pool scarce resources together to achieve more collectively than anyone can do alone? I mean, the government's not going to solve this problem on its own. PepsiCo's not going to solve this problem on its own. We have a big supply chain, but, you know, in the U.S., our footprint is about, you know, 3.5 million acres of farmland that we source from, right? You put that in the context of, you know, acres under the crop insurance program, it's... it's it's still pretty small, right? Uh, even though we're the largest food and beverage company in North America. So again, how can we embed this idea of public-private partnerships more firmly within Title II programs, for example, right? To offer you know, companies like ours, others who are really interested in, and serious about putting their money where their mouth is to match, co-invest, you know, help drive this work faster than we would otherwise. And that's probably the biggest area, uh, one of the biggest areas for us in the Farm Bill, yeah. So how do you award the early adopters? Some of the research that I've seen suggests that no-till is good the first year, but as you continue to progress, cover crops are good in the first year, but as you continue, it's more over a period of time where there's, there's real benefit from it. How do you address the early adopters and encourage continued practices? And I'll leave that open for the group. Yeah, I'll, I can start. I think it's critical that we do so, right? Uh, because these are farmers that have been doing the right thing for a long time. I um, mean, it's just, it, they'll tell a story as a way to lead into it. You know, our sustainability team tells us all the time. They were talking to, you know, a grower at one of our, our roundtable sessions and, you know, walked through what it would take to, you know, sort of qualify for some of these incentive payments. And he said, so basically you're telling me I just need to tear up my field for a couple of years and just let it lie dormant. <laughs> and then start all over again, and then I'll qualify. And that's the exact opposite of what do we want farmers to be doing, right? We need to find ways to reward these farmers. You know, I think um, uh, paying for practices is one way that you can do that, and, uh, and there may be others. Yeah. Um, Jeff, I, I've heard, we, we've heard from the chairman and ranking member of both uh, House and Senate Agriculture Committees today at this conference. I have heard all four of those individuals say without question that early adopters are not gonna be left in the cold in this process, and, and I think uh, we've heard that. I think that's a message that your listeners here can take uh, to the bank, so to speak, and I, I will tell you the Food and Ag Climate Alliance recognizes that as well. We recommended, Andrew, a one-time payment uh, for early adopters. You know, we don't claim that that is the exact necessary uh, you know, way of doing this, but it does demonstrate 
coming from us that there has to be compensation for the early adopters here. What about technology? And I spoke with uh, Senator Fisher of Nebraska, and she's on this week's open mic, by the way. She has legislation that's out that would encourage and to help producers to move, uh, to be able to afford to incentivize the step to higher levels of precision agriculture. I don't know if that's a farm bill. Uh, I don't know if that's a farm bill item, but that's certainly, uh, it costs money to, to have technology. We've all learned that, whether it's our smartphone or our smart watch or our smart light bulbs that are in the house, they cost more. But what about this area of making that technology more affordable for producers? Yeah, we actually worked really closely with Senator Fisher's staff in crafting that bill, uh, the Precision Ag Loan Act. Um, and we're really excited about it. We actually, EDF just released a report a week or two ago. It's all blur uh, in the past two weeks since right. my daughter was born. So um, I, but we just released a, a report also um, discussing the environmental benefits of precision agriculture. Fewer passes with the tractor, you know, more targeted application of fertilizer, things like that all have environmental benefits as well as, a, as financial benefits for farmers. And um, allowing smaller and medium-sized farmers to access this technology through a loan pro through through USDA loan programs is going to be vital in um, further adoption of those technologies. And that's something that we're really excited about, something that we worked really closely with Senator Fisher uh, uh, for that, that bill uh, in Congress. And so something that we're really supporting um, going into the Farm Bill. Um, that and then also the Precise Act was also introduced um, as well at the same time. So we're really excited about the prospect of this. But it does require further investments um, in things like broad, uh, rural broadband. You can have all the best technology in the world, but if you can't connect to the internet and really um, share that data, um, uh, it's, it's not going to be much use to you. So we need other investments as well. So is it safe to say that technology is going to play a role in improving these areas that we're talking about, whether it's crop insurance, climate, or conservation? Absolutely. I, I, you know, that is how you make progress in, in any sector, really, is, is through innovation and the adoption of new technologies, further education, um, teaching people how to, how to use these new technologies, um, and develop, building and developing the infrastructure to, to speed adoption. I may be saying the wrong thing here as a journalist. I'm just supposed to ask questions. But isn't it interesting that the nation and lots of people on the Hill are talking about climate and climate smart, but at the same time taking away crop protection products that producers need to be able to conserve the soil, to be able to protect the, pops, the crops without tillage. Frustrates me, Joe. Why am I sitting so close to you, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's ironical, yeah, though, isn't it? it? I mean, there's obviously uh, things going on at the Environmental Protection Agency in, in the crop protection space that I think uh, all of us are pretty concerned about, most everybody in this room. And um, we're all commenting. Um, on, on those actions. So let's go one step further. Uh, there is crop insurance and then there is disaster. And we have seen plenty of disasters as lately. Is there a way to create a permanent disaster program without affecting participation in crop insurance? I mean, I know it sounds really easy, right? Uh, we should just create a permanent disaster program. We've spent, you know, $70 billion on disaster since 2018, um, but for those of us that are a little bit older and have done six farm bills, we remember that this has been tried before um, and not very successfully. Um, we had the SURE program coming out of the 2008 Farm Bill. Um, it was extremely complicated. It paid out kind of, sort of, maybe when you had a disaster. Um, I think FSA called it the most complicated program they've ever had to administer. Um, so it's a lot easier said than done um, to create that kind of program um, that isn't going to disincentivize crop insurance payments. I guess um, I would sort of challenge uh, folks up on the Hill who are going to be making policy to, to take a step back first and, and just say to themselves, we have this program crop insurance that farmers really like, they support. Are there things we can be doing to improve that program to help replace and fill the gaps that have been, that have been filled by ad hoc disaster assistance over the last few years? Well, go ahead. Well, Jeff, our, you know, earlier panels today talked about the, uh, the, the risk associated with farming today, higher production costs. You know, producers 
who have seen that kind of increase in their production costs, they, they, they need certainty. You know, they don't need the uncertainty of the legislative process today. And believe me, it is a highly uncertain process, as most people in this room know. They, you know, they, they need predictability. They're going to get that on crop insurance. You know, to the extent that there are gaps, Congress is always there, but, but it can't come at the expense of crop insurance here. You're, it's a matter of, of uh, I won't say table stakes, but if you're insuring a crop, that's one thing. But if you're insuring against a hurricane in Florida that would wipe out uh, a, an orchard, that's not just a loss of a crop. It's going to be years before they come back to production. If you're talking about the derecho that worked its way across the Midwest, yes, there were crops that were lost, but at the shops, the storage facilities, the machinery and the rest, I realize there's, there's information there, but if you're talking about a d total disaster program, uh, y your risk exposure is huge. And if we're struggling to come up with dollars for simple crop programs, where do we come up the dollars to, to leverage those capital expenses that have taken years for producers to be able to afford? It sounds like a monumental task. Just speaking out loud. All right. Um, should we have more dynamic products for future climate risk? And the question continues, could range and forage products be to model to ensure against climate-caused extreme weather? Within the crop insurance space? Is that what we're talking about specifically? Anonymous didn't suggest that for us. But let's, <laughs> so you get the option to make that flexible if you'd like. I mean, again, the program is designed to be flexible. And we have seen uh, recently some parametric products um, be released by, by RMA. We had a, have a hurricane endorsement uh, policy, for example, that was released in 2019, I believe. So after 2018, we had Hurricane Michael, took out a lot of crops. Crop insurance didn't necessarily kick in. The losses weren't deep enough, but farmers still had hurt. So USDA, RMA, created a hurricane endorsement product that basically if wind speeds hit a certain level, there's a payment. It's cheap, it's easy, um, and helps farmers fill a gap that, again, wasn't already being filled by the program, but is, is a gap that exists. All right. I want to thank you all for being a part of this program, and let's go to closing statements, if we will. Andrew, you get the first shot, if you would like, uh, with regard to uh, your particular group and your concern for environment. This is where climate and conservation and crop insurance all come together. You've been a part of the team that's been looking at this future. Uh, what are your thoughts of this intersection? Yeah, I think I, I just want to sort of mention again how encouraged I think we, we were um, through the success of, of the Food and Ag Climate Alliance um, and our ability to come together um, and unanimously approve uh, these recommendations. I think there's a lot of great recommendations, um, substantive recommendations in there. And uh, another huge, hugely important aspect of that was just partnering with you know, our friends um, in uh, the ag, um, the agriculture and uh, policy space. And so um, that, that has been such a um, fruitful partnership uh, in our eyes and something that we are really looking forward to, to continuing on as we go through a farm bill and appropriations process and everything like that. You know, I think EDF really wants to be a trusted advisor and partner in um, environmental issues for farmers. And so, um, you know, we want to work with farmers and ranchers and foresters and everybody else to create good, sound policies that can um, help in this sort of transition as we, as farming becomes maybe more difficult uh, in, in, in a changing climate. And so um, finding ways to, you know, get conservation uh, technical assistance on the ground, um, finding ways to analyze gather, analyze, and share data, um, and um, also working with farmers to, per, to deliver incentives for more climate smart practices is, are th the things that we'll be looking closely to, and we're, we are willing to work with, with anyone and everyone to accomplish those goals. And so um, we, uh, we've been really, uh, we've felt very welcomed into this process, and that's been um, really important for us, and, and we've, um, we're really grateful for, for being part of the process. Chuck, your cooperatives are owned by producers, and you work to serve producers. You have a lot at stake here. 
We do. The Farm Bill is an important piece of legislation to us, Jeff. And I, I will just say that uh, if you've tuned into your sessions all day, which I think have been fantastic, um, you might have a, a note of pessimism associated with you. There, you know, there's been a, a lot of lines drawn, if you will. Here's how I look at it, you know, having experienced a lot of different farm bills, and that is farm bills that are about leadership. And when I look at, you know, the, who are the people who are going to be in the room, you know, during the drafting of this farm bill, um, uh, ranking member David Scott, chairman G.T. Thompson, ranking member Bozeman, uh, chairwoman Debbie Stabenow, and throw on top of that, I think, a very strong secretary of agriculture who has the ear of the president, and not every secretary has, I will, I will assure you of that. That's, that's a starting five, if you will, that it, you don't get much better than that. And that's my hope and optimism for a farm bill going forward in a timely way is the, the team that we're putting on the, on the court here. Terry, on crop insurance, it is the number one. Producers across the board, this is the number one. You have a target on your back, you always do, but you're at an intersection that helps producers manage risk and survive. Many who have purchased have said that in disaster, if it was not for crop insurance, not only would they have lost a year, they would have lost generations of an operation. So you carry an awful lot of responsibility as you're moving forward, but you've been a, you have a successful past. Yeah, I mean, I think crop insurance is well positioned heading into the future to, to, continue, to continue to be that sort of risk management tool, that go-to for farmers to help make sure that they can farm another year. But I think, you know, again, we're also there to be that first line of defense against climate change. When Mother Nature strikes, um, crop insurance is there to step in. So I think our role is going to be even more important as we head into an era of even more extreme weather. Um, and again, the program is designed to be flexible, to help meet some of these new challenges. I just think it's important that it be very principled flexibility, if you will, in order to maintain that integrity of the program so that we are able to maintain it for, for generations to come because it's a tool we don't wanna lose in the future, either through congressional cuts or because we took it down a path that it just couldn't sustain. Dan, I can't imagine going down this road without having you and your company in place and, and for your leadership in that realm and your outreach to consumers and for those on the Hill, we, we can't thank you enough. If you had the opportunity to sit in front of those leaders with the legal pad that will start to write and rewrite and craft, what are the things that you encourage and, and what are the things that you look forward to in this debate? Yeah, well, that's a big question, Jeff. Um, you know, it's you know, just putting back my you know my my old hat back on when I worked, especially on the Senate Ag Committee. What I appreciated most about that job is that it was very much a check your politics at the door, roll up your sleeves, get to work, and and do what's right for the uh, constituents that you represent. And I couldn't agree more with what Chuck has said about, you know, we have a starting five that, boy, anybody would want that when they're getting started to write major authorizing legislation. And I know at least you know, that's that's certainly the ethos there. So, and I don't think we've seen anything to, you know, there's all that, there's that saying about farm bills, they always get done, they rarely get done on time, right? Um, and I don't think we've seen anything to suggest that this one's going to be different, right? Got a lot of confidence in the crew up there, uh, you know, and they've got a very collaborative, transparent process for getting input. And they're, they're willing to work across the aisle and make sure that they're bipartisan in it. And if you have those elements and people that are committed to getting the job done, you're going to get something done. So. so coming up, you're about to hear from one of the strongest, most powerful female voices in Washington. And oh, by the way, Senator Stabenow is going to join us. Sarah White's coming up. In the meantime, I would like to point to Dan and just give you this opportunity as an extra thank you for being here. There's a video that's going to roll, and you gave us a little background of it before. Why don't, why don't you introduce the cut that we're going to see? Sure, yeah. Like I said, it's a 30-second spot. And... For us, again, it's about drawing that connection between the finished product, in this case the potato chip, where it's grown and who it's grown by. Just helping to educate consumers that your food's not grown in the grocery store. It's grown by a real person, it uh, comes out of the ground, and it starts as a commodity. There is just a total disconnect in this country between people and their knowledge of where their food comes from. And you know, this is our small part to start 
correcting that record. This is a multi-year um, investment from you know our company, and I think everybody will enjoy it. It's pretty clever. Yeah. Isn't it great to have good partners? Folks, thank you for putting up with me, and let's give them a round of applause as we go to the break. Lays are made from real potatoes from over 100 farms across America. There's one here, here, and here. Stay back, kids. We're doing another map commercial for Lays. Can't seem to get this one to stick. <laughs> Never a dull day on the farm. From real potatoes grown closer than you think. Lays, stay golden.